All right, welcome back, and welcome to some who happened to come in the second hour. So um, I was talking about this PowerPoint that I'm going to use as a sort of backgrounder, and I'll be sending this as an email attachment. So please take notes of uh, things, important points that I mentioned here. But this is uh, pretty much uh, uh, an introduction to the politics of the region. And we talk about more contemporary issues. As I said, you can go as many thousand years as you like in order to understand the Middle East. You, you may still not understand uh, even after an extensive study. So um, we talk about one of the important things, uh, this is kind of, you know, the the, the headings, these, the issues that I'll be talking, or at least uh, for the purpose of this week and possibly next Tuesday, we'll be talking about these things. Um, I mentioned here in the first hour uh, the formation of the Arab League. How many of you know um, something about the Arab League and we sort of, uh, for instance, do you know where the headquarters, headquarters of the Arab League, which country where it was established? Egypt is, of course, the home to Arab League the, and the headquarters, Cairo, the capital of Egypt. And do you know uh, the Secretary General of the Arab League? Do you follow the news? And, this is someone who's been there for so many years, who used to be the Arab, uh, the Egyptian foreign minister. Do you know? Okay, uh, let me introduce you to <laughs> Mr. Amr Musa. Well, uh, and you know him, the, the guy next, <laughs> next to him. Well, this, this picture was taken uh, earlier this year, uh, again in Paris. There was this Global Zero Summit. Global Zero aims at bringing down the number of nuclear weapons in the world to zero, which is a, I know, an ambitious target, but it is something that is, in my opinion, worth, uh, you know, working for. And uh, Amr Musa was one of the participants. And after a comment I made there, he just came next to me and said, you know, how much he liked the comment and. He wished sort of uh, Turkey pursued that policy with respect to uh, the American nuclear weapons that are deployed in Turkish territory, which I suggested that they should be they be back, you know, taken uh, back to the or sent back to the United States. Uh, and then we had an uh, occasion to have dinner with other people, other participants, and he's a nice guy, and uh, he sort of uh, kind of promised to. Oops, sorry. Meet again when we uh, get back. Sorry, I'll I'll have to find that e PowerPoint again. Don't look at my emails. <laughs> and you can see yours. I mean, asking me, sir, I you know I want to learn uh, the Middle East. I'm, that's why I'm taking this course, and I promise I'll be working hard. And please. Tell your secretary to register this and that. And I have a picture here as well. This one, for instance. Maybe I should turn up lights here. Is it better? Yeah, this is uh, Israeli territory, and you see Palestinian. Well, uh, well, this is not that uniform as you see here. It's like uh, Dalmatians, and there are you know, uh, settlements. Uh, this is one of the biggest and most sort of contentious issues in the Arab-Israeli conflict, and the uh, one of the uh, most or important impediments to a resolution of conflict between Arabs and Palestinians. Well, the issue, uh, the, the sort of. Uh, the controversies between the state of Israel and the Palestinians, of course, in its essence, but it is something that goes 
far beyond the Palestinian Arab or Israeli problem. It has become an Arab-Israeli problem. After all, Palestinian people, not all of them, but most of them are Arab. Therefore, it is quite natural that Arab nations have displayed a certain degree of interest to this problem. But other than that, other powers like the United States, of course, is a strong uh, ally, which gives its you know, strong backup to, the, uh, to, to Israel. And also Iran, uh, especially over the last uh, couple of uh, decades, has been involved in this problem as well, and some other sort of countries uh, in the region. And more recently, Turkey has also uh, become a part of the problem, and or just uh, been one of the actors which uh, tries to find a solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict with a view to you know bringing stability to the region. Anyway, if we go back to our um, PowerPoint here, again, one of the issues that I mentioned was the um, fall of dynasties and the place by military rules uh, in especially countries like Egypt, Iraq, and Syria. Of course, uh, each time Israel fought against Arab nations, it has more or less gained additional territories and consolidated its territory and also its statehood. I mean, its state structure. That has something that you know, was somewhat beneficial from Israeli perspective because Arabs have never been, uh, contrary to what was um, sort of expected with the creation of the League of Nations, and contrary to what was stated in the charter of the Arab League, Arab nations have not been able to display uh, solidarity and enough strength to stand up against Israel and, uh, and or to be successful in, in, in their fights against uh, Israel. And Israel has almost uh, on every occasion took advantage of this situation and not only expanded its territory, well, of course, uh, at once, especially after 1967 war, the so-called Six-Day War, or uh, six, day, six Days War or June War in 1967, they, of course, uh, had Sinai Peninsula, which, after all, was traded with Egypt at the uh, expense of uh, uh, peace between Egypt and Israel. And Egypt has been the first country, as we will talk about later, to recognize the state of Israel. And that's why it, they were expelled from the Arab League. And the Arab League's headquarters were uh, moved from uh, Cairo to Tunis, the capital of Tunisia. Uh, anyway, so going back to the uh, 1950s and, and the, the consequences of wars between uh, Arabs and Israel, of course we have seen ultimately, especially in Egypt, rise of Nasserism and pan-Arab uh, ideology. This is an important episode which lasts for about 15 or so years where Nasser uh, had his signature, I mean, has had his impact on uh, the politics of the Middle East. Um, of course, the coming to power of uh, Nasser uh, in Egypt was not a straightforward or just a quick phenomenon. Eventually, he sort of uh, emerged as a charismatic personality well, uh, especially uh, um, in the fight against Israel, some were humil humiliated uh, in, in the administrations of Arab nations. But yet, uh, this, the free officers coup, which ultimately or eventually uh, brought Nasser to power, had a certain you know, ideology. I mean, they, they were unlike the previous sort of uh, elite who administered Egypt, these people were mainly from rural area. I mean, not necessarily uh, nobility. I mean, not from aristocracy or elite uh, sort of people. They were coming from uh, the, you know, the rural area from the countryside. And of course, with, an, uh, with a view to advancing or the elevating the life standards of uh, their people. One particular um, objective was, of course, to get rid of the British colonials. This is, that was something which could be 
uh, you know, which could not be sort of uh, compromised by enemies. Of course, elimination of feudalism, land reform was something that was promised to the people, God bless, and was, of course, according to many political analysts, was a source of many conflicts that Egypt had undergone domestically. I mean, because that was not necessarily successful enough, and that, you know, the, uh, at some point, according to uh, my readings, as far as I can recollect, I mean, a very small minority, like maybe, you know, less than 1%, own more than one third or even more of lands and of Egyptian lands, cultivable lands, I mean, where you could, you know, uh, do agriculture. And so they seized power. And those who were holding on to power, I mean, this power, of course, had a say, had, had much to say in the administration of the uh, country. But after this land reform, of course, there were many small sort of landowners. Uh, which did not necessarily, you know, uh, combine uh, or could not combine their powers, and they were not necessarily effectively using this uh, sort of uh, power that they had. Anyway, so we are not going to go into details about Egyptian domestic politics, but according to some analysts, as I said, that was one of the reasons for further sort of deterioration of uh, domestic situation. Um, one, again, one objective here was uh, to create a, a powerful army, I mean, military sort of capability, which was um, one of the uh, beliefs of almost every sort of military people who rule the country, but more specifically of uh, Nasser, because that, in their opinion, was the only way to get the you know, Palestinian territory back from Israel. Israel proved itself, starting from the first of these wars, this, this series of wars between themselves and Arabs, that they had superior military capabilities. And uh, one important anecdote here, something that uh, I'll be uh, talking about more extensively in the coming weeks, was uh, is that um, Israel actually uh, when even before it was created as a as a nation as a state before the proclamation of uh, Israel officially uh, important figures in Israel have come together I mean primarily Ben Gurion Shimon Peres and Wiseman and especially Ben Gurion was so anxious so determined to have what was called absolute power. Absolute power meant atomic power, I mean nuclear power. And this is something that happens in 1947, even a year at least before the official proclamation of State of Israel. And we know this from the writings of Avner Cohen, who is a, is a distinguished scholar and also a friend as a colleague with whom I, uh, on many occasions, had a chance to chat and discuss over his writings and over the situation in the Middle East. And most recently, it was in May 19, I mean this year, uh, we met in Doha. And just by coincidence, you might remember, those who are interested in you know, watching TVs or reading papers on politics, political issues, um, there was a... Uh, sort of a, a newspaper article, if I'm not mistaken, something that was actually an excerpt, a, sort of a, a, a summary of uh, an article that would be published or a book that would be published later on about, uh, you know, Israeli nuclear capability. Uh, and Avner Cohen was right next to me sitting, sitting uh, and, and over the phone, you know, giving interviews to people who, was, who were calling them. So, um, According to Avner Cohen, Israeli, the founding fathers, and more specifically it is Ben Gurion, who is very much committed to having this um, absolute power, namely nuclear weapons capability. Otherwise, he believed Israel could not survive within this hostile environment. 
Well, and according to him, uh, I would say, uh, if somebody else were in his place, Israel might not, might not have been successful in getting through all the way uh, to having uh, what is not officially acknowledged as being there or what is uh, not uh, being denied uh, either, namely nuclear weapons capability. So, therefore, uh, Israeli sort of survivability today is so much uh, believed by the Israelis themselves and political analysts is that it depends on their nuclear capability and therefore uh, there are some other countries who are trying to match Israeli capability and maybe for an eventual desire to eliminate Israel. This is something uh, that we can understand in between the sentences of some of the statements made by some leaders in the region. So I'm not going to go into detail right now, but this is important. So since from the beginning, the uh, ambition to match Israeli military capabilities has been there in almost every nation. But of course, we should not uh, um, think that that was the only reason as to why Middle East is so overarmed today, or, or the you know, the presence of uh, all sorts of weapons capabilities exists, is not only Israel. I mean, there's, there has always been uh, other reasons, even more substantial or more important reasons for the Arab nations or nations in the Middle East to arm themselves. I mean, for instance, uh, even today at present day, uh, there is this deal between the United States and Saudi Arabia for the sale of uh, some uh, aircraft and helicopters worth of sixty billion dollars, six zero billion dollars, and this will be the probably the single most uh, highest figure uh, of arms sale between the United States and any country, as far as I know, and especially in the Middle East. And Saudi Arabia will buy like approximately eighty-five or so new uh, state-of-the-art. Uh, uh, F-15, uh, uh, I guess, and they will, some of their existing aircraft will be upgraded and there will be all sorts of attack helicopters and all, all, all sorts of other, you know, metro helicopters, all of which combined will amount to something like $60 billion. I mean, whether this is necessary for Saudi Arabia or how this will implicate uh, the uh, arms sales through the region uh, by other powers, like France is always sitting on the fence to find new customers, etc., etc. So there has always been uh, many, many reasons, actually, uh, in the Middle East for countries to arm themselves. But one particular reason, and maybe the, something that triggered, uh, especially Egypt under Nasser, to uh, invest in armament, was of course the ambition to match, to, to equalize, if not uh, you know, uh, overcome the military capabilities of Israel. <clears throat> um, well, these are some details, but uh, what, what we see here, of course, under the British colonial rule, of course, and arguably e Egypt was, you know, uh, or did not have any um, contradiction with uh, Western uh, countries because it was ruled by the elite who were brought to power or maintained in power by the British and the Western powers. So you could not expect uh, a radical sort of a controversy between the, the sort of a, the Egyptian ruling elite and, and the West. But Nasser's uh, succession to power and holding on to uh, power in the country eventually alienated Egypt from the West. I mean, distance, uh, put a distance between Egypt and the West. And because of this ideological stance, Egypt, even if you go today, I mean, uh, you can see in the streets of Cairo or elsewhere, uh, people who very much look like Egyptians 5,000 years ago. So there is therefore this uh, notion or understanding of being an Egyptian 
even being over being uh, an Arab. So Egyptian identity is sometimes clashed or sometimes uh, seen as being superior by some, not all, of the Egyptian people over, I mean, when compared to Arab identity. So Egypt, in a sense, in its foreign policy, did not only pursue an Arab foreign policy, and Egyptian history or legacy of, of the past has, has always been an important factor in their sort of a foreign policy making and also in, in their national identity. So this is something important. Well, this is uh, not unique to Egypt, but of course Egypt is one of the uh, most ancient civilizations. So there are Egyptians who associate themselves maybe more with their ancient past rather than current Arab sort of uh, uh, identity. Well, this is quite normal. Or at least there, there is this mixture of the two. So, um, and that was more so maybe during the dynasty period or the king or the sort of uh, elite uh, during the colonial rule. But Nasser, who was someone from, uh, as I said, a rural uh, uh, area, and he emphasized the Arabness, I mean, Arab identity of Egypt. So under Nasser, we could see Egypt sort of pursuing pretty much almost entirely an Arab sort of a foreign policy and and also propagating this and, and uh, throughout the Arab world and therefore um, he was categorically against uh, a colonial rule or imperial uh, rule or intervention of great powers in the regional politics and that he taught just like stated in the Arab League, which was not necessarily something uh, uh, done in his presence, but something that uh, in, in some respects uh, uh, were uh, upheld by him, were, were supported by him to, I mean, pursue an Arab foreign policy or Arab policy. And therefore, he declined to join the, the Baghdad Pact. The Baghdad Pact was a product of what I would call uh, the Eisenhower sort of doctrine, which aimed at creating, uh, you know, um, big and small alliances in the region, which would get support of the uh, United States, with a view to protect, of course, U.S. interests overseas. I mean, the United States, and that was a period of transition. As I said, uh, uh, this region was ruled for long centuries by the British, by the French, and other colonial powers, and Ottomans, but during the decline of the Ottoman rule, and that was the, the subject of what was known as the Eastern Question. And Eastern Question was as to whom would replace the Ottoman rule, whether it would be the French or the British or others. So, and French and the British were forthcoming in, in sort of a taking over of the rule from the Ottomans. If not de jure, because Ottoman Empire was still there until the end of the uh, First World War. And, but in de facto situation, British and French have you know, uh, been effective. So, but over time, especially as I said, uh, in the post-World War II period when French and the British were war weary, I mean, were sort of uh, tired of uh, fighting the World War II, they were victorious powers, but they were devastated. Their countries, I mean, Britain, France, well, France uh, surrendered and did not sort of undergo much destruction, but Britain, economically, politically, they were not in a position to sustain their powers, or at least, I mean, uh, ex uh, project their military capabilities uh, to control everything uh, on a daily basis. So there was this period of transition uh, of the rule of the region from British French as the previous superpowers to the United States and to some extent, of course, uh, the Soviet Union in opposite camps uh, as new superpowers of the you know, uh, post-World War II period. And during that time, of course, in order to contain the Soviet expansionism, of course, the United States was erecting some pacts, alliances, one of, uh, one of which was, of course, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, in, in continental Europe, 
with, of course, inclusion of the United States and Canada in North America, and eventually Turkey being together with Greece being part of it. And in the Middle East, there were such organizations which brought together Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, and Turkey, Iraq, Iran. So they were all aiming at sort of uh, containing the Soviet expansionism and blocking the Soviets or preventing Soviets from coming down to uh, the, um, the Middle East, which actually was very rich. Oops, sorry for that. Um, let's. So, blocking the Soviet expansionism toward the uh, oil-rich regions, which were strategically very, very important. So, but the Baghdad Pact, which has a long history, uh, I'll, not, I'll be, not be talking about at this moment, but uh, Egypt and under Nasser denied to be part of it, and not only himself stood away from Baghdad Pact, but also used its influence on other Arab nations such as Jordan, uh, such as uh, uh, Syria, to stay away from it. And after the military coup in Iraq, which of course toppled the uh, dynasty and you know, brought the military to power, then Baghdad Pact, I mean, Iraq was not part of it. And since the capital of Iraq, which was now under the military rule, which was not part of Baghdad Pact, uh, which was its capital indeed, of course, the pact could not survive. At least, uh, uh, eventually just uh, faded away. Uh, so therefore, this is uh, something that, in a sense, that was seen as uh, a, a, you know, um, alienation of Egypt from the West. So under Nasser, because of his ideological stance, and not so much in the sense that, I mean, when, I, when we talk about ideology, we do not mean, I do not mean here socialist ideology as we have seen as in, in Soviet Union. Under Nasser, um, Egypt was at an equidistant position uh, both to the Soviet Union and to the United States. I mean, him being uh, alienating uh, himself uh, from the West was not because he was getting closer, at least at the beginning, toward the Soviet Union for ideological reasons. He was not obsessed with socialist ideology, I mean, in per se. But eventually, he developed something uh, like uh, uh, a, you know, a mixture of both Arab identity, Arab nationalism, and socialist uh, sort of ideology. And there is therefore this emergence of what is not now known or then also known as Arab socialism. So it was, on, in one respect, it was uh, you know, featuring some nationalist undertones, but also socialist stance it was kind of interesting mixture peculiar to the radical or Arab world, which eventually made these countries more radical, I mean, in their stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, Western nations. So um, his defiance rose him to regional prominence. I mean, Nasser's charismatic stance and his defiance of the colonial powers, superpowers, standing up against them and just sort of uh, uh, just like today, for instance, not at, at the same level, at the same extent, but I can see whenever I read these comments made after Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the uh, president of Iran, Islamic Republic of Iran, his defiance of uh, U U.S. pressure and also European pressure uh, sort of gains him a lot of, uh, um, I don't know, uh, reputation a lot of sympathy in the Islamic world, also in, in the uh, Arab world. Even though Iran is not an Arab country, I can tell you in the streets of many Arab nations, the profile of Iranian president is pretty high. Um, so is Turkish prime minister's uh, profile is very high because, again, of his 
stands in some respects, not in all uh, likelihood, but in some respects vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the you know, uh, situation in Gaza uh, and, uh, and Israel and the stance of Israel. So in the past we have seen this and therefore um, Nasser gained a lot of prominence, gained a lot of reputation and had a lot of uh, uh, followers. Sorry for that. So, of course, uh, as we stated earlier, uh, Egypt had this desire, like many other Arab nations, to advance its military capabilities. And uh, that was pursued more so uh, by Nasser. But he, of course, uh, he, he, he could not uh, realize uh, some of his uh, desires, and he was approached by uh, the uh, the Soviets at the time, and because uh, not because um, the Soviets were in, in fond of uh, Nasser, but because of co of course uh, political reasons. Let me see if uh, in the next. Sorry for that. Yeah, I mean, this is something that uh, is accepted as the turning point in the history of Middle East, the Suez Canal crisis, something that I mentioned at the beginning of the first hour. Nasser uh, desired to buy certain weapon systems, and Western countries declined to provide Nasser with, or Egypt, with this because uh, they would most likely be used against Israel in the first place and also because of his stance vis-a-vis -vis the Western nations. And at that time, as I mentioned, the Soviets were quite ready to provide Egypt with necessary arms, weapons, munitions, and that was somewhat you know, uh, presented as a different deal, arms deal between Czechoslovakia and, uh, and Egypt. And uh, of course, uh, Egypt did not have enough financial resources to uh, get these arms. And one way uh, which was uh, taught uh, by Nasser was uh, the nationalization of the revenues of uh, the Suez Canal. That, of course, was not acceptable for the French who built the canal and also British who heavily depended on the canal because it was uh, on their way to still, oops, sorry, again this, um, to the uh, southern Asia and where they were doing uh, all this trade. This is, of course, uh, not something that will be uh, allowed by the British. And as I said during the first hour, British, French, and Israelis have come together and, and launch an offensive, which of course was not accepted neither by the United States nor by the Soviet Union. And um, the reaction of the United States, the intervention of the United States, putting a halt to this war and forcing the British, French, and Israeli troops to withdraw from their positions wherever they were, um, uh, of course, cause a trauma in, in these capitals, London, Paris, and Tel Aviv. So um, this, again, something add more reputation, more prominence to Nasser. I mean, because, well, in, in one sense, if you look at the issue militarily, uh, that was not a successful war from the perspective of um, Egypt. But the ultimate uh, result, the, the result of which was a political success. After all, the United States intervened and forced the three powers who have attacked Egypt to withdraw. So that was a political success and added much more reputation to Nasser uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, or as a political figure. So this had uh, a big influence on Arab people. And what we have seen, especially in Syria, uh, Egypt was a role model, and um, 
it was uh, he was someone who was seen as a savior who, who could save Syria from falling into the hands of uh, communist sort of uh, uh, rulers. And we have seen upon the proposition uh, or suggestion that came from the Syrian uh, people, uh, the creation of uh, the United Arab Republic, which did not live for long. And the reason why it did not live for long because the uh, United Arab Republic uh, was formed. Well, when you look at the uh, maps uh, here, Syria uh, and Egypt having a distance between the two, uh, forming a one state, which pretty much you know, was difficult to rule. And it was ruled from Cairo. The, the capital of the two was seen as Cairo. And the Syrian uh, politicians, uh, deputies, a military sort of uh, elite uh, who are supposed to be you know, uh, in, in their proper places in, in Syria were uh, asked to be here in Cairo. So uh, therefore, uh, there were some problems uh, in, in, in on the ground in terms of uh, administration. And more important than that, uh, Egyptians and Nasser politically and you know, ideologically dominated this uh, United Republic. And Syrians actually, after some time, started to complain and also uh, you know, uh, found it difficult to uh, continue this republic and did not uh, last for long. So in 1961, it just disappeared. One important turning point in history of the Middle East was, as I mentioned, the June War, or Six Days War, because the war lasted for only six days, and during which Israel extended its territories and also defeated three nations uh, within a span of uh, actually three days or so, especially using its air power in, first of all, eliminating the air powers of its uh, enemies, Egypt, uh, Syria, and Jordan. And so, therefore, this is something that uh, had far-reaching consequences for the region. Um, of course, the, uh, the profile of Nasser, as I mentioned, was so high that he was seen as a, I mean, or his ideology was seen as a panacea for every problem in the Middle East. I mean, people thought Nasser would solve almost every problem. That was the inspiration, that was the perception of the period. And uh, it has been, of course, uh, in the um, sort of uh, uh, political agenda of Nasser to achieve some goals, such as liberating Palestine from Israeli occupation, strengthening, of course, Arab nations, uh, more specifically uh, Egypt, and stopping Israeli expansion, territorial expansion. But what followed was almost the opposite, uh, the 67 war. Egypt lost uh, Sinai Peninsula. This part, which is strategically, geostrategically extremely important, not only as a land, but also uh, as a buffer zone, as a you know, um, uh, territory between Egypt and, and uh, Israel. It is something that provides enough strategic depth from the e Egyptian perspective, a safe distance between capital Cairo, Cairo and uh, Israeli sort of uh, military units. So, but overall, this is a significant land portion, a huge, something actually maybe bigger than Israeli territory anyway. So, after the 67 war, uh, that was lost to each Israel. And um, also control East Jerusalem, which is still at present day, uh, according to some statements made by Israeli uh, politicians, Netanyahu, for instance, Lieberman today, uh, and others, uh, East Israel, which is claimed by the uh, sort of Palestinians to be the capital of Palestine, state of Palestine, 
is or can by no means be left to anybody and that it is from Israeli perspective it is a Israeli territory and they have they started control East Jerusalem Gaza and West Bank uh, after this war let me just show you this map again um, um, the other map will show you better Gaza and West Bank so um, the, this war in a sense enhanced the position of Israel uh, which was um, the actually the, the opposite what was expected from launching this war well the 67 war and the June 67 war actually uh, started based on uh, wrong or misperception or wrong information or miscalculation it was so uh, um, suggested by the Soviets that an Israeli attack was imminent and um, of course the, the intelligence reports were not necessarily reflecting the reality but uh, Egyptians, Syrians wanted to take advantage and they sort of uh, uh, made some military preparations but Israel preempted and uh, especially the first strike was against the air powers of these countries and they eliminated an overwhelming majority of almost 80 percent of the Syrian and um, Egyptian uh, air powers and in the absence of air uh, power or because Israel was controlling or had almost undisputed air superiority the conduct of war was not that difficult and uh, eventually uh, came to a halt because um, Arab nations were defeated and um, one of the consequences was of course further radicalization of the Palestinian problem under uh, al Fatih, uh, which was created already with a view to pursuing the uh, objectives of the uh, Arab uh, Palestinian people and we have seen uh, Arafat and al Fatih becoming or dominant uh, among the Palestinian people and what we have seen especially after 67 war um, but its parties and the military eventually uh, taking control and we have seen these two uh, sort of in Iraq and Syria these two countries becoming even further uh, radical and establishing deeper relations with the Soviet Union which eventually led to a uh, another series of conflict between uh, Israel and Arab nations and also within the Arab nations because uh, there's, there has always been a, a rivalry among the Arab states with respect to whom would be the leader I mean Egypt, Syria and Iraq always claim to be the leader of the Arab world and this uh, aspect has been one of the reasons as to why Arab unity could not be achieved. Of course th this is not the only factor but there are other factors which have uh, sort of uh, paid away to this result but for instance uh, you know some Gulf countries which are quite rich in terms of oil resources and financial assets and there, there is this sort of a disparity between uh, in terms of richness between these countries and some other, other Arab nations where people are living in misery so therefore among many factors this has been another reason as to why the Arab nations could not come together because of this rivalry I mean even though there were Ba'athist parties Ba'ath party uh, as we call it uh, in Iraq and Syria they were at some point even more than you know rivals I mean they were almost fighting each other I mean if not uh, in the battlefield but in proxy wars and so there was this uh, animosity hostility between Iraq and Syria for so many years and one of one of the reasons uh, was of course the different interpretations of uh, uh, Ba'athist ideology so uh, let's let's for the moment stop here and uh, because I'll continue with more maybe 
uh, details with the uh, other developments that follow the 67 war. Please keep quiet for a while. And what uh, war and peace in the Middle East in the 70s and 80s. And these developments will sort of uh, bring us to the 1990s when most of what we are seeing today have started. I mean, with especially Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and the wars that followed and uh, all other developments that we now see in the Middle East and likely to see in the future. All right, I'll see you on Tuesday. Don't be late. I'll start at 9.30.